This morning, I, I have a very special message I believe is for our church specifically. As I look to the Old Testament, I don't believe that the, the battles that we see there in the Old Testament where they were battling the enemies uh, of God, that they were just for that time. I believe that they had a spiritual implication for us. We're not today just battling for ourselves. We're, we're battling for the souls of men to, to carry out the Great Commission. Seven years ago, Ron and I began this battle. We met down here in town one day when we were both in law enforcement. And as I was thinking about this in our little town of Springville, and Ron and I at the time, we were, we were thinking about the idea that, that at the time of this, that we began this in uh, 2012, June of 2012. In fact, the message I preached on that uh, Sunday in June was perhaps God. Little did we know that what we were getting into. At that time, 50% of the 8th graders in this little school were not graduating. The drug scene in, in Springville was rampant, though maybe many of us didn't know it because we were in, you know, in our own little world, but we didn't realize what was going on around us. In fact, one man blatantly would sell drugs off of Tule River Drive with, with disregard for anything. In fact, he had put the fear into those he sold drugs to. And as Ron and I were thinking about this, I, even this last week, we were, we were talking about the idea of how many people we had seen over those years in this past seven years that are either gone or removed, that no longer can do the things that they did. When we started, we, we wanted to affect a physical change upon our community. But the reality is, is what we needed more than physical change was a spiritual change. And as we began this, we were naive to the battle. Not knowing that the spiritual forces working against us were very powerful. The first resistance would come from the church. The spiritual leaders of our day would contest everything that we would do. And yet the giants remain in our land. Once again this morning, I believe we stand on the precipice of taking the land like they did in the Old Testament. I have asked you to consider this. This isn't about a building. This isn't about us building a building so we can have a church. This is simply a headquarters so that we can go out from there and spread the gospel to our community. It cannot be about a building program. It cannot be about anything else. It cannot be about a community club because we are not going to have one. In the Old Testament, I believe the Bible gives us an account, and the, the Lord specifically gave me this this week. I had actually a message ready to preach to you, and I had to change it. In Joshua chapter 14, verse 12, the Bible says, Now, now then, this is Caleb speaking, Give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. You, For you heard on that day that Anakim were there the great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. I want you to picture this in relation to our city today. You know, as Caleb was getting ready to take the hill country, I thought about our hill country that we love. Many of us love the mountains around us. That's why we're here. We love to, to be alone. We love to get away. That's why we're here. But I want you to picture the enemy in, in the sense of the spiritual atmosphere that's going on because Paul said it like this because we struggle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the, the rulers and against authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces in heavenly realms. You see there are different levels at work, a hierarchy if you want to call it. Some of these we can't come against. We can find ourselves defeated and afflicted because we're not prepared. 
but they must be fought by God's army. He is the one that restrains. He is the one that pushes back. He is the one that removes these evil forces in the heavenly realms that are over our territory. Contrast that to us today. Hebron was one of the cities they took right there near this. And it was a city that was at about the level 3,000 feet. The Bible says in chapter 11 of Joshua, so Joshua took his entire land, the hill country, all the Negev and the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills and the Arabah and the mountains of Israel with their foothills and from Mount Halak which rises toward Seir to Baal God in the valley of the Lebanon below Mount Hermon. And he captured all the kings and put them to death. And jo Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. I want you to see something that stuck out in my mind that he, he waged war for a long time. So many times I think we think that it's just going to be, we just speak it and it's going to happen. But the reality is, is there is this battle that's going on. And this was not even against the giants yet. This was against the cities that they were coming against. Forty years earlier, Moses had spent, sent men into the land, 12 of them, to spy it out. And it says in Numbers 13, it says that, But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread a, among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw are like of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. Who were these people? Who were these sons of Anak? They're found in, the, in Genesis chapter 6. And I want you to think about this, that they had specifically placed themselves in the hill region, in the mountainous regions. Christians and pastors and scholars will tend to, to gloss over this because they don't want to talk about this whole idea of giants in the Bible. Yet giants play an important role as we will see that through Joshua and through Caleb and through David that God used these men to defeat these giants. In Genesis chapter 6, it says when, when, the, uh, when the human beings being, began to increase in number on the earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Now I want you to understand this morning, I don't want to get into all the speculation of how this occurs, but it's simply put this way. Wickedness was such a time as we had not seen before. In fact, God had to come down and He had to rain down on the earth right after this because of our wickedness. Spiritual beings, demons, mated with women and had offspring. And they became these giants. Some of us today, well, that's weird. It is weird. It doesn't make any sense. But let me tell you something. Men, man is wicked. And utterly wicked at this time that the, the spiritual forces that were at work were powerful. These men, in, the, in fact, in Genesis 4 and 5, he says that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So I'm, I'm guessing because we see them after this time, after the flood, that somehow they came back. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children with them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination and thoughts of the human heart was only evil at the time. This is what it looks like at the time. Giants in our day are the spiritual forces that are at work today. Paul spoke about them in Ephesians. He's, he talked about these, these realms, these spiritual levels, this hierarchy. There are outside biblical writings, outside of biblical writings, there are, these giants are thought to have become demons that were left on earth to harass. Regardless of how we fall into this, I believe it's very possible. In fact, that these giants, these demonic forces, actually are the ones that carry out in hell. All the punishments. Now, if that isn't enough to scare you into heaven, I don't know what else you need. They're here to harass the earth. 
These principalities and powers still rule over these areas. Sometimes you'll hear spiritual people talk, or those who in the, the, operate in this realm uh, that will talk about the, the strong man that's over a certain area. There's a strong man over Springville. I wasn't going to talk about this, but my wife reminded me this morning. The Lord gave me a vision early on in this venture for Springville. And he showed me the giant. At the time, he stole my patrol car. And then he began to harass. I was chasing him down without a gun. Interesting that today I'm <laughs> not a police officer anymore. I knew there, there was nothing, I didn't fear it, but I thought to myself, what am I going to do when I finally capture him? I was moving him back and, and chasing him away. As we move forward, let me send this warning. The enemy will always try to harass, aggravate, agitate. He'll bring discouragement. He'll bring fear. He'll bring assumption. He'll bring offense. In the day of Caleb, it was, it was this promised land that they were getting ready to take. And only Joshua and, and Caleb came back and said, we can take this land. And in Numbers 13, it says that we, can, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than us. And, and they spread among the Israelites this bad report that they had when they explored the land. Many times this is what happens in Christian realms, in the church. Don't mess with that. A bad report. But God had said, I'll go before you. I will take the land. Our response to these giants in the land, maybe some of us would be of the other ten. Hey, Greg, maybe we're there today. These giants are too big. Let's step back. Let's rethink this whole thing. Moses even confirms what they were saying is true. He says it in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, you are now about to cross the Jordan to go in and dis dispossess nations greater and stronger than you with large cities that have walls up to the sky. The peoples are strong and tall, Anakites. You know about them and have heard it said, Who can stand up against the Anakites? The enemy is going to do everything possible to get us off course. You may have negative feelings or, or an issue about a person or how you've been treated or look at this job and say it's too big, it's, the obstacles are too tall and, and, and God, what, and how can this even take place? The truth is that it is. It's too big for us. I want you to know this morning it is too big for me. It's too big for Ron. But then Caleb said this. He said, silence the people before Moses and said we should go up and take possession of the land. For we can certainly do it. Later he says, perhaps God. Perhaps God will act on our behalf. Caleb was 40 years old when he said this. After they had spied out the land, we should go and take possession. It's 40 more years later before he gets to do it. I unpacked the life of, of Caleb this morning and I found these things about a great warrior and I want them in our church. I think they should be in our lives. The first one is this, that we wholly follow God, wholeheartedly and fully. Six times in the Bible and it is never said of anyone else like it is of, of Caleb. Uh, so frequently testifying about this man. In fact, in Deuteronomy 135, it says, Moses says, No one from this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give to your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. He will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. It's repeated in Numbers, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly. Is that us today? Because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, none of those who were the 20 years or older 
or more will come up from Egypt, will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. What made these men so different? Numbers 14.24 says it like this. Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went into and his descendants will inherit it. There was something distinct about him that he didn't just have his own spirit. He had the spirit of God residing within him. That was what made him powerful. That is what made him be able to say, yes, let's go and take this land. We must pray that we will have the same spirit. It is not a spirit that everybody possesses so that we can follow God wholeheartedly. This isn't in natural ability. Joshua, about Joshua, it was said this, that so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man who is of the spirit of leadership and lay your hand on him. There's something distinct about these two men, Joshua and Caleb. Jesus was talking to his disciples after he had been resurrected. You ladies will know what I'm talking about because my wife, and we didn't know this until we talked this morning, but she's been bringing this up in the Bible study. And they didn't understand. They just could not grasp what was going on. And Jesus says in Luke 24 that he, he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. I'm going to say this to you today, and I hope you guys can get this. Many of us think we understand. We don't. Many of us think we know, and we don't. We come to church every week. We've read the entire Bible, but we do not know. We need to humbly pray that God would open our minds, that we could have this spirit put in us so that our minds could be opened, so that we can see this is not an intellect. This is a supernatural thing. It's God-given. Holy, following God, wholeheartedly, fully. The second thing is that they were wholly following God. They had set themselves apart. They had consecrated themselves. In fact, in Leviticus 18.3, it says, You must not do as the, they do in Egypt, where you used to live. You must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. Do not follow their practices. The church today looks more like the world than the, than the world looking like the church. We're supposed to be the examples. The world has become the example. We live in Canaan and we look like the Canaanites. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nation I am going to drive out before you became defiled, he says. If it became so bad that God said this in 25, even the land was defiled. So I punished it for its sin and the land vomited it out, its inhabitants. But these men... Joshua and Caleb. Joshua said before they were getting ready to cross, he said, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. See, Caleb was right there with Joshua. Our job is consecration. It's more than going to church. It's more than keeping the commandments. It's more than tithing. It's more than sharing your faith. It's more, more than see, repeating the sinner's prayer. It's more than volunteering. It's more than raising your hands in worship. In other words, they were, they were set apart for the exclusive use of God. They were devoted to His service. Consecration means dethroning yourself and enthroning Jesus as Lord of your life. It is the complete divesture of all self-interest. It's giving God veto power. It's surrendering all of you to all of Him. God wants us to be consecrated before Him. The last thing that He had was a patient and persistent resolve. I'm going to read the entire little account here if you guys would follow along with me in Joshua chapter 14 and we'll be starting in verse 6 there. 
think the story just out of the Bible says it better than anything. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barney, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites went up with me and, made, and it made their hearts and the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance. And that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as you, the Lord has promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time He said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you have heard on that day the Anakim were there with their fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Here we are again. The boldness to ask for this promise. The part in it, the uncertainty of perhaps. We know this in Isaiah. He says, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her praise on earth. I have appointed watchmen on your walls, Springville. They are to never be silent. Call upon the Lord. Give yourselves no rest. Pray until He establishes Springville and makes her the praise of the earth. What's our vision? Our vision this morning is not a programmed vision. I've seen pastors do this for 50 years. They have a vision. They have a church's vision. I don't want that. I want God's vision. Yeah. I want His vision for us. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt as I speak to you today, this is the vision for our church. God is saying, listen, you make your request known to me. You cry out for the lost. And we will fulfill the Great Commission in our little sector of the world. We ask God to push back the forces of darkness that have blinded men and women. We are asking God for salvation. I believe the enemy has blinded the eyes of those who want to be saved. And we're asking God today, move back the darkness. Tear down the giants. Drive them back in the name of Jesus. This morning we don't go about making proclamations or declarations or attempting ourselves to fight this spiritual battle because it belongs to God. We cannot drive them out on our own. It's God working on our behalf. I have heard people pray fire down there. They maybe feel like they're doing some good and praying judgment, but the reality is they're praying the judgment on themselves. These spiritual giants are just that. They are huge. It is God and His righteousness that will move back the enemy and that drives them back. And we follow God wholeheartedly. We walk in holiness, in His statues, and we pray for a move of God on our behalf. And perhaps God will act on our behalf. We slay the bear and the lion first in our own lives. There are plenty of long-lasting battles we can see in our own city. Before they ever battled giants, David battled the lion and the bear. Many of us want to slay giants, but we have to slay the bear and the lion in our own lives first, destroying the completely the works of sin in our lives so that we don't look like the world anymore. I will tell you right now, if there's sin in your life and you stand up, try to stand up to one of these giants, you are going to be afflicted and you're going to be cut off. And I say that to myself too. 
Pastor Mike used to say it like this. We deal with our sin ruthlessly. That's the picture of the Old Testament. When they came in and they drove out the enemy and they slew everybody in that city. God said, listen, I want you to slay your enemy. I want you to slay that sin ruthlessly in your life. And with others, we deal with their sin gracefully. See, we see these pictures in the Old Testament of God saying, annihilate the city, cleanse it, cleanse the land. We must annihilate sin in our lives first. Selfishness, pride, anger, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, offense, petty things. We are about a work that's beyond our, our, our hemisphere, guys. Today, Greg knows about it. I have a summation, and it's this. That we would realize that there is a battle going on. Some of us don't even rec recognize that it's even there. Number two, that the enemy wants to destroy us and those we love. He wants to destroy you. These giants want your mind to be basically covered so that you cannot hear God's word. And as we walk in uncompromised wholeheartedness, two things happen. It positions us to slay the giants in our own lives. And number two, it positions us together to slay the giants in our land. That's why I preach this message every week to you guys about think differently and, and all these things. I'm telling you the last couple weeks, we should go back. I'm telling you, go back. And if you've missed any of them, go back and look at them. God's setting us up for something. Look, I cannot force or coerce or manipulate or instruct or command God to do anything, but I can plead my case. I can appeal to His nature. I can cry out and then perhaps God. So what's our vision this morning? It is that. That we could act, that God would act on behalf of our city for salvation. God's vision, our burden... Our vision in this morning is not for a big church or to promote some program, even the food ministry, but it is to carry out the great commission of God. Go and make disciples. Joshua said in Joshua 15, 13, in accordance with the Lord's command him, Joshua gave Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judith, Kiriath, Arba. Arba is the father of of the Anakites. That is Hebron. Arbam was the forefather of Anak. From Hebron, Caleb drove out three of the Anakites, Sheshia, Ahimna, and Telma, the sons of Anak. This morning, I want you to know perhaps God will act on our behalf and move back the darkness, even the clouds this morning, that, that the fog that sometimes covers our own minds. Caleb, along with his clan, dispersed, dispersed the giants that had possessed the land. And at that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, the Beer, and from Anab, and all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israel territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. That's what we want for us. To remove them from Springville. Did they go away forever? No. We find David fighting them. Remember we just said that one of them went to Gath. A champion named Goliath who was, who was from Gath. <laughs> Came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and, and a span. Caleb's name means faithful or faithful devotion like a dog. Wholehearted, bold, and brave. Some of you this morning are on cruise control. God's blessed me. I must be doing okay. Let me say this to you, and let me make this a mark for all of us. Don't mistake God's mercy or His blessing or His favor for approval on our lives. God carries out His plans regardless of men. Success, success, success does not mean approval. A good example is King Cyrus or 
President Trump. The race of wholeheartedness. Imagine yourself running a race. People who run track understand the idea of hurdles. You can prepare for them. But imagine as you run this race, obstacles are placed in your path unexpectedly. Hurdling things are thrown at you, dodging darts shot at you all around. At times feeling like you're trudging through mud. But you keep moving forward. You will be pressed and get discouraged. You will find yourself offended by others. You will look down and see that you're not even running anymore. I've slowed. Am I even in the race? You must keep moving to the prize. This life looks exactly like that. Arrows shot at your feet. Javelins narrowly missing your head. Caleb should have given up. He'd spent 40 years with a generation that would die off. Imagine everyone you knew, except Joshua, gone. All your friends. And now you're going to go do something for God? Joshua said, now then, give me this hill country which the Lord spoke on that day. For you've heard on that day that the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Sometimes we think that the, the move forward or, or our proclamation has to be some kind of positive declaration. Sometimes it just needs to be perhaps. Sometimes, and, and as we look at our lives at times, we can see obscured in the sovereignty of God is, is what God wants to do. And so perhaps is the best we can do. Caleb set out with no guarantee that God would give him victory. He only knew that he was totally dependent on God and that God would give him success. And that was enough. As a people of faith, we need to be open to the perhaps moments as we follow God. Not necessarily knowing the destination, but trusting our guide. Often we are tempted to hold back our faith because we're not sure of the outcome. I'm hesitant to ask somebody to come to church. I'm, ask, I'm hesitant to tell them about the Lord because I might appear foolish. The line between foolishness and faith has only been a matter of perspective. This is why our vision this morning is cast in stone by God. We will live wholeheartedly for Him. We will live wholly to Him. We will be persistent and patient for what He brings. This morning, I felt so important that I bear my heart to you guys and say, this is where we're going. I want to see the enemy defeated, moved back as we come together that's why we do those prayer nights. Our last prayer night was just a crying out to God. God, on behalf of those who are lost. This morning, as we close, I'd like you to all stand with me.